All right, good evening. Good evening. Welcome to evening number two. I appreciate everybody coming out. I want to say thank you to uh, Reverend Atkinson for accepting the invitation. So if you look on the back of your flyer, there's a pretty nice looking guy on there. And I would be willing to bet that at the end of his message, if you want an autograph, he will sign it. So you just have to ask him um, and it'll be free, no charge. Um, but I want to make sure I announce something to, oh, it's a charge. <laughs> My bad. That's right. I forgot. We do have nursery available. We love having kids in here. This is no pressure, but we do have nursery available. And then we're doing an offering each night, uh, whatever the pastor that's preaching that night would like to, for the money to go to. And so tonight it'll go to Memorial Chapel in Bishopville, which is where uh, Reverend Paul Atkinson is the lead pastor. And they'll use that to reach out to their community and to love on people as Christ commands us. So without further ado, I'm excited for the Southern Methodist Choir and Miss Kimberly to come up. So I'm going to get out of their way because, one, they're better looking and they sound better. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, pray, and we'll get this thing started. Father, we just love you so much, and we thank you for everything that you do for us. God, we thank you for this opportunity to come and worship in your house. God, the fact that we can come together, it doesn't matter the denomination. It doesn't matter anything except for our love for you and your love for us. And so, God, be with us this evening. Be with Kimberly and the choir, and be with Paul as he brings the message. And we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. How is everyone tonight? It's good to be here to see my family, friends, neighbors on the second night of revival. Um, thank you, Ryan, for inviting us to come. I appreciate it. Um, this is a, a first tonight. I get to serve alongside Paul, which I'm excited about. Um, Somehow he got a picture. I'm not sure exactly how that happened, but anyway, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, one of our goals tonight, I think, and Paul will agree, is we're going to try, is it to embarrass our mothers or to not embarrass our mothers? That's to be determined, but they're both here tonight, and we're thankful for our family that we can worship with them. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Kimberly Newsom. I lead the music over at the Southern Methodist Church, and this is my wonderful choir and this is pretty good group for a Monday night I mean it's been a long work day and they all showed up for me and I'm so thankful for them and I think you will enjoy the music that they're going to bring tonight and uh, our goal and our prayer tonight is for the Lord to use all of this music to touch anyone who may be struggling to comfort anyone who may need comforting and to reach those that need Jesus that is our primary goal um, so we're going to start with a little congregational singing if you will take your hymn book, we're going to turn to hymn 499, and we're going to sing all of Victory in Jesus, and then we're going to follow that with hymn 500, the first and last verses. Will you please stand and join me as we sing? Precious blood. 
We'll sing the first and last. Last night I was asked why we do the offering before the preacher preaches, and it's because I don't want people to hold on to their money after they hear the message, so especially tonight. But uh, we're looking forward to it. So at this time I'd like to ask the ushers to come forward. And uh, again, this offering will go to Memorial Chapel in Bishopville, uh, Paul Atkinson's church, Reverend Paul Atkinson's church.
Without further ado, I want to ask uh, Reverend Paul Atkinson to come up, and while he's walking up, I will tell you, this is one of my best friends. Um, the thing I love about Paul is his heart, not just for the body of Christ, but for the least of these. Uh, some of you probably know, all of you probably know, because most of you know Paul, but he spent a lot of time in the mission or in the uh, prisons and, and did a lot for the prisoners and really showed where his heart is at, so Open your ears and listen and allow God to move your spirit this evening. Thank you, brother. It is always an honor and humbling when another pastor allows you to stand behind the pulpit of his assignment. So I thank uh, Ryan for asking me to be here. It's even more of an honor for me tonight being able to serve with Kimberly. She's obviously um, got all the talent. Uh, and she's much more polished than I am. So I hope you enjoyed her introduction because I don't have that. Um, I just enjoy the word. I enjoy ministering um, to people. And this is much like coming home for me because I spent a little time uh, here, and I have a lot of family connection here, um, so it is a privilege, uh, just an honor um, to stand where I am tonight, and thank you very much. That was awesome. Um, last night we heard from a, a pastor who I really respect, uh, one who I am learning to love. Uh, I have not known him uh, that long, but I was very impressed with his uh, message uh, last night, and he left us with a question. He used a question from Scripture. Um, are you the one, or should we expect someone else? The question that came from John, as John sat in prison, John the, Baptizer, John the baptizer, not the Baptist. I hate to break y'all, bust y'all's bubble on that. Um, he was a baptizer. Uh, somebody found that funny. Thank you for laughing. <laughs> somebody got it. Um, and he kind of posed that question to us last night. As we look at our call upon our lives, as we look at the situation in which we find ourselves as a church, the pastor kind of pointed his finger at us. At least I felt like he was pointing his finger at me. Are you the one? Or should I expect someone else? I don't know about you, but the more I thought about that question, the more I think about those men and women and children who have come into my life with questions about what we believe and why we do what we do as a church. The questions from the world that we live in. Are you the one? Are you the one? Are we the one who will answer the call now for the gospel? Are you the one? Are we the church that will stand tall for justice and equality in our world? Are we the one? Are we the church that will deliver a testimony of unity and love? Are we the church that will finally fellowship one with another as if we are truly family? Last night that question was pointed at me. I don't know if the question was pointed at you. I hope you got the same thing I did as are you the one, or should I expect to get that from somebody else? Because I don't know if you know that or not, but if that question is asked of you, that is a life and death question for people who don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. 
when they look you in your eyes and they know you profess to be a Christian and they look at you and say, are you the one or should I expect someone else? I can promise you right now, if you don't show your kids the gospel, they will find another gospel someone else. Somebody will be happy to give it to them. So tonight, I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to Philippians. That's where we're going to be. But I'm going to ask you a follow-up question. If you are the one, what you going to do? If you are the one, what you going to do? Let me pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for an opportunity to be right here tonight, Lord, we've taken the opportunity to sing and and praise your name and worship, and Lord, just what a privilege to be able to do that. What a privilege to be able to be in your house. What a privilege to be able to gather with a family of like-minded individuals. Well, Lord, we sit here right now with our hearts and our minds and our Bibles open. We've come tonight expecting you to speak. So, Lord, as always, you know that my prayer is that this family doesn't hear two words from me. That the words that they hear are from a God who loves them immensely more than I could ever imagine. The God who sent his only begotten son so that we could have salvation. And in that salvation, a God who has granted us the opportunity to be a part of the gospel. Lord, what a great responsibility. I pray that we listen. I pray that we hear what you say. And I pray that we are fearless to do as you call. And Jesus, we love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you are the one, what are you going to do? I'm a believer that right now, right now, in our lifetime, is the most, is the best time to be a Christian in the history of the church. We all have a chance to see God do something miraculous. Because let me tell you where we sit as a country. Right now, as an American country, we sit on the edge of spiritual collapse. Now, I'm not bashing America. I love America. There's not a bigger patriot in here tonight than than standing right here. That's me. I love America. But we stand on the edge of total collapse of the Christian church and value and morals in our country right now. And you may say, well, what's so great about being there? Because we're going to have front row seats for a great move of God. Just hear me out. One way or the other, we are right on the edge of seeing the greatest revival of Christianity that this country has ever seen since the time the first people landed here. A time in which we haven't experienced in several hundred years. Or either, or either, we're going to see total destruction. One of the two. Now, I also am a believer that God is in control of everything. I don't know if y'all know this or not, but God ain't left his throne. You may think the world's out of control, but I promise you right now, there's no way you can read through this book right here and believe that God is out of control. He's still firmly on his throne. He ain't going nowhere. He ain't going nowhere. Either revival or destruction, it'll all be of God. It'll all be of God. The reason that I think it's exciting to be a part of the be a part of that is because God, in his infinite glory and his infinite sovereignty, could have chosen to place you and me at any other time in the world, any other place in the world, and yet he chose us to be here. He chose us, us, to be right here, right now, in this time in America. I want you to think about that just for a minute, and I hope that it doesn't build up a sense of pride, but I hope it builds a sense of humility in your life that God could have chosen to put you anywhere else at any other time in history and anywhere else on the globe, and yet he chose to place you here. 
for a time such as this, for a time when a country that's supposedly based on Christian morals is wrestling with the idea of whether or not it's okay to murder the unborn. For a time in which Christian children going to school are penalized and jeered at because they had the audacity to say that they're special enough to believe that they were created by God and they did not come from monkeys. A time in our world when we are wrestling with things that should be common sense. And God has placed you here to be a part of this organism, not this organization. We're not an organization. We're a body with a head. He has placed you in the body of Christ to do what? To do what? If you are the one, what are you going to do is the question. I've read the Bible through several times, I have taken time out in my life to sit down and really concentrate on spiritual gifts and try to figure out is there a working list of things that people can be tasked with when they become a Christian. And you know what I can't find? Sitting idle in a pew. I've tried to make it okay, but I can't. I cannot find in the Bible where it's okay for a church to operate inside of, a, inside of a commercial building and nowhere else. I cannot find it. I want to make it okay. I want to make it easy, but I cannot find it. So what are we going to do? Is it possible for us to push the tide towards revival, I believe it is. I believe it is. But I know what it's going to take. It's going to take the church, me and you, regardless of what denomination you say you are, regardless of how much melanin you got in your skin or the lack thereof, regardless of what country you came for, from, what your native tongue is, regardless of any of that, it's going to take the church acting like the church. If my people who are called by my name, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. How many of you have seen that on Facebook? How many of you have heard that on the news? How many of you have recited that from your spirit? How many of you have actually said that or, or got it tattooed somewhere? Listen to me very carefully. I talk with people in my church all the time, and I look at them and I say, do you believe we're in the end times? How many of you act like believe that you're in the end times right now? Do you believe that we're closer today than we were yesterday? Do you believe that this is the end times? Do you believe that everything that we see on the news points to the fact that we are getting closer and closer to Jesus coming back? Everybody believe that? It was a trick. I wanted you to shake your head because if you truly believed it, you'd live like it. If you truly believed it, we'd be out screaming Jesus at the top of our lungs. We'd be out on our hands and knees playing with kids, making sure they know the gospel. We'd be at that trailer park over there spreading the gospel as hard as we could if we truly believed that this was the end time. My biggest fear as a pastor is that Jesus comes back and catches us all in church sitting here doing nothing. That's a hard thing for me to say as a pastor. You know that? That's a hard thing for me to say. Because I love church as much as anybody in here. I love church. This is, this is me. Right here behind this desk. 
This is me. I love this. But my fear is when I sit down across the table from Jesus that he's going to look at me and he said, you know, I was that girl as, at the cash register at Walmart that you were ugly to because you didn't have time. I was that old lady pushing the buggy in the middle of the aisle at the grocery store and you run into her because you didn't even see her because you were too busy trying to get your potato chips and wasn't paying attention. I was that little boy. who was raising his siblings on your street because his mom and daddy weren't like yours. And you never saw me. I wonder how much Jesus is going to ask me about this. And I feel like the conversation is going to be more about that. God has given us this great responsibility, and I know that God in all of his power can bring revival to this country tonight. But the church has got to do their part. We've got to pray. We've got to seek his face. The world has got to see us doing that. The world has got to see us doing that. The reason that I picked the scripture tonight is because I felt like it went very well with what was said last night and the question about what are we going to do. Much like when John asked his question, the Apostle Paul was also in a very familiar place for Christians. He was incarcerated at the time that he wrote the letter to Philippi. We're going to look at chapter 1, and we're going to start about verse 27. The Philippian letter is a book of joy and thanks for this church's generosity. They had supported him during his ministry and during his struggles, which were many. The man was incarcerated several times. In the first chapter, Paul speaks about the church and their faithfulness. He reports to them success of the forward movement of the gospel. He reminds them of his struggle in the faith. He reminds them very, very later in this first chapter that, the, that his imprisonment and the threat of death is not stifled his desire to carry the love of Jesus to the world. He assures them of this when he says to live is Christ and to die is gain. We all know that verse. It comes from the first chapter of Philippians. And then he says this to the church starting in verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. If you look at these verses in the very first part of verse 27, translating that into Greek actually ends up a little closer to only behave as citizens worthy of the gospel of Christ. We know that Paul understood the value of citizenship. If you know anything about Paul's life and you read in the Acts of the Apostles, Paul was one of those that was quick to point out that he was a Roman citizen, a Roman citizen not something that he purchased but something that he was born into. That citizenship served him well. But if you read his letters, he also makes it very clear that he was, citizen, he was a citizen of a much larger kingdom than that of Rome. You, you know what that means, right? He was a kingdom of heaven. Your freebie for the night. You ready for it? 
I love America. But the kingdom that I'm a part of dwarfs America. My citizenship lies in a place that is on its way, a kingdom that is not here yet, that we are only catching glimpses of. And one day it will be full. And that kingdom, we don't vote every four years. There is one king. He has always been king since the beginning. He is king today, and he will always be king right up until eternity, which never ends. Paul understood that he was a citizen of that place, which means if I'm a citizen, that I must live by the laws of that kingdom. How many citizens of the kingdom of heaven do we have in here tonight? Interesting thing about um, being citizens of a kingdom. See, in America, we have these little people that drive around in cars, and they got blue lights on top of them. We call them the popo. I'm a chaplain for the popo in Lee County right now. A hard job, a thankless job most of the time. Um, but if you're really slick, guess what you can do? You can get away. You can break the law because they're not everywhere all the time. They don't see what you do in private. In fact, if you stay out of the line of sight, it's usually better for them anyway. Not so in the kingdom of heaven, because in the kingdom of heaven, there is only one commander in chief, and he sees everything. He's everywhere all the time, even in your hiding place where you think you're getting away with everything and nobody's seeing you. The kingdom of heaven sees it. The moment in time you don't live by his rules, he marks it down. Sobering thought, isn't it? Some of you are thinking right now, oh, Lord, I did that today. Amen? Oh, me? <laughs> Paul looks at the church at Philippi, and he says, listen, I just want you to live your life worthy of the gospel that you carry. It means if you're going to claim to be a citizen, you've got to act like it. There are rules and regulations that go along with the kingdom. If you want to look like a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, you've got to act like it. It matters because people are watching you. They watch you come in and out of this place every week. They're questioning right now. Citizens of Turbyville community right here tonight are wondering why in the world would a group of people get together and set aside however much time to be together on a Monday night or a Tuesday night or a Sunday night. They're asking themselves why. Tomorrow, they're going to be watching you in your career. They're going to be watching you in your day-to-day -day decisions. They're going to be watching you when you're in the grocery store. And they're going to continue to ask themselves, are they living up to that? Are they living up to that? One of the most interesting things that I found while I was working in the prison setting was that I had the awesome opportunity to pray in conversion with a young man who was a Muslim. I ministered to this guy, and it was one of those situations that it was all God. It didn't have nothing to do with me. I just happened to be there. It was all God. And it was very interesting because I was also very good friends with the Muslim imam. So I knew I was going to be in trouble. The Muslim imam came to me that afternoon, and he said, I know what you did. And I thought, well, that's it. I'm fixing to get killed. And he sat down with me across the table and he said, listen, I don't have any problem with him converting to Christianity. But he better live it. He better live it. If he wants to leave our group and join that group, that's fine. But he better live it because I'm going to be watching because if he's just playing a game, I'm not going to put up with that. And I thought, boy, that's harsh. We need more of that in our churches. An interesting thought. But if you really think about it, we've already got it in our church because one day me and you are going to have to sit down across the table from the master and look in his eyes and answer for everything that we did. And you may fool the preacher, you may fool the church, you may fool the community, but you will not fool him. 
only by living in step with the uh, with a life worthy of the gospel will we bring about that revival that we pray for every time we get out of step with it we ruin our testimony it confuses the ones who need us the most and the God of heaven has no place for confusion or chaos that is not the God that he is we must live worthy of the gospel if we dare to carry it one of my favorite verses in this is and, and it starts with a, a question for you do you think folks are talking about you how many of you think folks are talking about you do you think people are talking about this church you know our prayer should be that they are I pray that they're talking about the church. I pray that they're talking about the First Baptist Church in Turbyville. I pray that they speak about the Southern Methodist Church in Turbyville. I pray that they're speaking and talking about and questioning each other about Memorial Chapel in Bishopville. I pray that every church is on the tip of everybody's tongue in every community. Paul says this, so whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you. Paul basically looks at the church and says, I don't have to be there to see what you're doing. If you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, I'll hear about it because people are going to talk about that. They're going to be asking questions. Why do y'all folks act the way you do? How are you so patient? Why are you so generous? Why in the middle of struggles that makes the rest of the world fall apart? Where can y'all find, how do y'all find joy in the middle of that? How can y'all love each other when the world is telling everybody that they should hate each other all the time? If you live like that, the world is going to talk about you. My prayer is that they are talking about you. A question was posed to me some time back. If your church disappeared tomorrow, would your community know it was gone? And this guy was asking me, he said, you know, if your church just completely disappeared, building everything, went away, parsonage, the whole deal, if it just disappeared in your community, what would people think? Would their initial thought be, good, we can put a McDonald's there? Or would their thought be, boy, I'm going to miss the love that I found in that place. I'm going to miss the the hope that that place brought to our community i'm gonna miss the help that that place brought to our community do other places hear about what we're doing or are we of no account paul said to this church i want to hear about you that way whether i come there or not i'll know what's going on so just stay the ta stay the task do what you're supposed to do, and people are going to talk about you. And you know what? It may not all be good. I don't know if y'all know this or not. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Sometimes we get our eyes focused on people, and we say, boy, that's my enemy. You don't have an enemy that's flesh and blood. You have an enemy that is much more powerful than flesh and blood. And if you claim to be a Christian, he absolutely hates you to your core. And he'll find any willing participant in your community <laughs> to speak ill of you. To speak ill of you. Paul tells the church, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. So he wasn't speaking about people there. He was speaking about a true opponent. The true opponent is Satan. He was speaking about that opponent. That opponent. How do we defeat that opponent? How do we defeat Satan? Sit there dead like you want to. Don't answer if you don't want to. I'll have all of you down here praying for salvation. Because that's the only way you're going to defeat him. 
You cannot defeat Satan in and of your own power. You cannot live better than him. You cannot do it without the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only way you can defeat him. But with the blood of Jesus Christ, you can laugh at him. With the blood of Jesus Christ, you can go on and do the, have the freedom to love people the way that Jesus loved you. You can have the freedom to give away all your possessions because Jesus is going to provide for you. You have the freedom to live like no one else on earth lives because there's no one else on earth that can laugh at the devil because he's not a laughing matter. But covered by the blood of Jesus Christ... I can do all the good and they can talk all the trash they want to. He can trash talk me all he wants to. Because as long as I'm doing what the Lord wants, it just reminds him of what's coming. It just reminds him of the power of God. Me and you, we're the worst thing the devil has ever seen. You want me to know? You want me to tell you why? I know how broke I am. Y'all know how broke you are? I ain't talking about financially either. I know how broke I am. I know how sin wrecked I am. I know that it takes the blood of Jesus Christ to save me. I know that. Deep down in my soul, I know that I am lost with no hope without Jesus Christ. And boy, that just drives Satan crazy because if he can use me, Broken me, if that blood can use me as a weapon against his kingdom, that means he can use anybody. That means he can use anybody. He can use everybody in here. It gives us permission to laugh at the opponent. It reminds the devil of his destruction because it reminds him of our salvation. Lastly, Paul recognized that this was not easy. All the commendable things that this church had done, had been doing, was a struggle. Paul himself sat in prison. But in verse 29, Paul says that this struggle has been granted to you. I want you to just read that for a moment. That this struggle that you are facing, it has been granted to you. This is one of the things that I think the church is really struggling with today. Because we have those who are preaching in our midst that once you become Christians and if you have enough faith that everything in your life will be better. Oh, what a dangerous gospel that is. That is represented zero places in the Bible. Zero places. When you switch teams, listen to me because there ain't but two choices, y'all. You're either on the Jesus team or you're on the Satan team. When you switch teams, the other team does not like that at all. You gain an enemy. That one who has had your back your whole life before you came to know Jesus all of a sudden does not like you very much. You become a target. You become a target. This is what discipleship was all about. If, if really and truly the church understood that about our kids, we would never let our kids come to salvation without placing an elder with them everywhere they went to support them and disciple them in the new walk because they are going to get crushed if we don't stand there to protect them. That's what discipleship is. Discipleship is easy. Discipleship is just, I need you to hold my hand and show me the way. I don't want to walk by myself. That struggle has been granted to us. Paul actually speaks about it as if it was a gift. And it helps us to realize that it all carries eternal weight. The struggle of this life is just as important as the blessing. It all carries eternal weight. I've seen that over and over and over again. I have seen it in the lives of guys who will never get out of prison because they have killed people 
who will stand in front of your face today and testify to the fact that they are freer now than they have ever been in their entire life because they met Jesus. And had he left them on the streets, they would have, they would have died and gone to hell. That's always been a powerful testimony to me. Paul says it has been granted to you. The struggle is not accidental. The struggle in your life is not because God has forgotten you or doesn't see you. The struggle in our world is not born out of chaos and confusion. It is in the struggle that our testimony shines the brightest. It is in the struggle that our testimony shines the brightest because it requires the most faith. And what our world needs now more than anything is faithful people of God living godly lives in front of them where they can see it. Not being afraid of struggling. Not being afraid of the devil. But reaching into our communities with the love that Christ shown us, showed us. So, if you are the one, if I am the one, what are you going to do? Do you have that power? Can you, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, minister to someone who is lost in their addiction? We got any addicts in Turboville? <laughs> You're not by yourself. You're not by yourself. Can you, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, explain to a young child the importance of what it means to believe that they were fearfully and wonderfully made, not an accident of the cosmos? Can you, with the love of Jesus Christ, be with someone who is grieving for the loss of someone they don't think they can live, they could ever live without? Can you step in to the life of someone? Can you be a mom to someone that you're not biologically connected to? Can you be a father figure? to someone who doesn't have a dad? Can you spare something in your kitchen to make sure that your neighbor who don't know where their next meal is going to come from to make sure they have what they need? Is the $5 at the gas pump, and I'm not saying you got to do this every time, I'm saying listen to the Lord. Is the $5 at the gas pump when the guy wanders up to you at the car and says, listen, I just need something to eat. Is the $5 you put in his hand really going to kill you? The little girl that's checking out your groceries just had a bad day. Are you really in so much of a hurry that you can't be nice? That you can't just be nice? The moment in time that we as the church quit living by kingdom rules, we have ruined our testimony. This is of no account. This matters not. Because all they see is what you do outside of here. Look around. Those people that you're going to minister to tomorrow, are they here tonight? They'll be paying attention tomorrow. They're not here. My prayer is that we take what we do here the rules that we live by here, the kingdom that we worship here, the God that we say has all the power in the world, the Holy Spirit that anoints us, that we take that out of here and take it outside where it matters. And we make sure that that's the drive of our church. Our church. I use that term loosely anymore. My church does not meet 
in Bishopville. Your church does not meet in Turbyville. Only a small piece of it meets here. The piece that you may see. My church meets all around the planet at different times. That's the church that I'm involved in. They call themselves all kind of names. They worship in every language. Some dance. Some sit very quietly with their hands folded and never make a sound. But they're all my church. They're all my brothers. They're all my sisters because they're all covered with the same blood that I'm covered with. And until we realize that, the revival that we so pray for in this country will never come. But when we do, oh, oh Lord, <laughs> I'll get Pentecostal in here in just a minute. When we do, when we realize the power of God and the power of us together, worshiping one God in one accord, <sighs> there won't be no reason to start no fire, no revival. We won't have to worry about that. God will work all that out on his own. My prayer for you tonight, and I think we have a, a song for our altar call. My prayer for you tonight, the altar is going to remain open. I'm not even going to let Ryan come back up here. The altar is going to remain open. Here's my prayer for you. You may be sitting in here tonight and saying, you know what? I've been going to church. I don't want you to go to church anymore. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? I don't want you to go to church. I want you to be the church. And if you find yourself in that place where you say, you know, I'm just in the, I'm just in the, in the motions. I'm just going. It's just something to do on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and sometimes Wednesday. I'm just going. I want you to come up here and pray that the Lord will ignite that fire back. Your community needs you. Your church needs you. Your family needs you. Your marriage needs you. Your children need you. This place, this community needs you. It's a life and death issue for those that don't know Jesus. And what if you're the only hope of them ever meeting him? What if you're the only hope? You're the only Jesus they ever see. Somebody that just goes to church is not going to is not going to fit the bill. Somebody that just goes through the motions is not going to do it. It's got to be somebody that's got the gospel in them so so thick and so anointed with the Holy Spirit that they can feel God working around them. If you want that, my prayer is that you will ask for it. That you will ask that the Holy Spirit anoint you, that the Holy Spirit shows you tomorrow the person that he wants you to speak to, the person that he wants you to show kindness to, the person that he wants you to pray for, the person that may just drag you out of your comfort zone. Praise God. Amen. I hope he does. She, who or he or she is. I hope they drag you out of your comfort zone kicking and screaming. But I pray that you're fearless enough to do it. That you are so caught up in living by the kingdom rules that you won't let the rules of this world slow you down from showing the love of Jesus to the one who needs to see it. You come and pray as they sing.
Church, I want to thank you for being here. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, let's stand and we'll pray together. Same time tomorrow night, sir. All right. We'll certainly be praying for that. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you. Thank you. We thank you. We thank you for everything that you have done for us. Lord, you have provided and protected so that we could be here tonight and share this experience with one another. And Lord, what a blessing it has been. My prayer is that each person in this room has heard from you. Lord, you don't have to say the same thing to all of us. But Lord, I know that you have spoken. And I thank you for that, Lord. I heard you. And Lord, I pray that I make the adjustments in my life that will look more like you. That I love people more like you. That I make sure that I don't relegate you to just a few hours a week but, Lord, that you are a part of my life, that the rules of the kingdom are second nature in everything that I do because I live for you before everything else. Lord, I pray for each person that's in here tonight. Pray, pray blessings upon their family. I pray for an anointing afresh of the Holy Spirit as they leave here tonight, Lord. May they drag that out into the community and may this community be changed because of the love that you have placed in them. Just keep your hand upon them, Lord. And, Jesus, we love you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you all.